Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Tuesday, June 6th, and Mark, this you're here. The show has begun. Yes. Last one for a little while. Yeah. Vacation's coming. You guys have a great rest of your week. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. <laughs> I'll so hang around. Mark's going on vacation, but not quite yet. Yes. He's here for the 9 a.m. I'm excited. Uh, so today's obviously the anniversary of D-Day. Mm -hmm. And in a, about this time next week, I will be standing on Omaha Beach oh my goodness. in Normandy, France with my father for a long planned trip. So looking forward to it. That's very cool. Yeah. I'm very excited for you. Uh, so you're going to miss the heat that Justin's going to I wouldn't say yeah. I'm missing it, but I will miss you guys, including you, Justin. Oh, well, Warren. thank you. Yeah, you got about, what, about an hour and two minutes left. You're almost there, buddy. Almost there. <laughs> I already tried to get out of here, but yeah, you tried. Uh, it is, it is going to be hot coming up. That's kind of the theme I think we have going forward. In the meantime, we're still waiting on a few more showers and storms. We saw some good rain yesterday, at least in spots. Not going to see that kind of coverage today, but there is the chance there for at least a couple pop-up storms this afternoon. Let's look at authority radar. You'll see that. There is nothing there, unlike yesterday, where we already had storms at this point. Nothing to look at yet. I think it'll probably take another couple of hours before we see some development uh, with some of that daytime heating. Uh, the kids had 12 hour forecast, 81 at 11 o'clock. By noontime, we start to add in that 20% chance of rain. 87, 3 o'clock, 88, 4 p.m. Again, not great rain chances, but they are there today. Temperatures will top out around 88 degrees. It'll feel warmer than that with humidity involved. Our weather headlines. Not as many downpours today as we said, 20% chance. Then the South Texas furnace cranks up. Uh, the heat next week looks uh, not so nice. Uh, we're going to talk more about that. Plus, some interesting going, goings on in Puerto Rico. Some unusually high heat indices there. We'll talk about why. We'll show you that as well and a look across the country as uh, travel season is underway. More on that in just a bit. Let's go over to Stephen now. Speaking of travel. How are things going at this hour? Well, Justin, I know that this was something that you encountered on your way into the station this morning. A lot of folks are still seeing the problems out there. Let's get a look. 10 at UTSA Boulevard. This is what we've had our eyes on since around 5 this morning on GMSA, and it's still ongoing. Take a look at 10 at UTSA. This is in the eastbound lanes. We do have traffic that's moving pretty slowly through the area. Uh, Transcat just a few moments ago zoomed in, and we were able to see that this does involve some sort of big rig or 18-wheeler. Uh, no confirmed information yet on whether or not there were any injuries. We Hope everyone is doing okay, but the cleanup process has taken several hours for now. Actually, now that we're at 9 a.m., I did send a follow up email to San Antonio police hoping to get a few more details, but no word yet on when this is going to clear out. You can see that it's very busy in both the east and westbound lanes. Take a look here at our map. We're seeing a lot of activity out there, red, orange and yellow. So that indicates that traffic traffic in that area is experiencing some congestion on the northwest side. Not the only issue right now that I'm tracking. Let's get a drive right over here to the southwest side where we do have another crash reported at 35 southbound at loop 410. This crash is not causing any issues for drivers. As you can see, it's pretty green in all directions, but we'll keep a close eye on that as the morning commute does continue. Giving you a wide look now back at our metropolitan area. A lot of the slowdowns have uh, reduced, so that's great news, but you can see that we still have some along 1604 where we have some construction not too far from where that crash occurred earlier this morning. So again, watch out here at 10 at UTSA Boulevard. This is right around La Cantera. We'll continue to keep a very close eye on that and I'll have an update, hopefully from San Antonio police coming up a little bit later on in this newscast. Guys, San Antonio police looking for a suspect who they believe is armed and dangerous in connection to a shooting last night involving officers on the east side. They already have two people in custody, but a third person is still on the loose. This all started just before seven last night in the area near Dawson and Giver streets. Officers tell us that they started following the suspects after seeing them shoot toward a building. The suspects then began shooting at the officers. Those two suspects in custody face possible charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, but the investigation continues. Police did not give a description of the third suspect that they're looking for. Here is today's 9 at 9. The Subcommittee on National Security, the Border and Foreign Affairs is holding a meeting today. The hearing will discuss staffing challenges on the border. This comes one day after a second plane with migrants was flown to California. Nearly three dozen migrants have arrived in Sacramento since Friday. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is recommending criminal charges in connection with migrant flights from San Antonio to Martha's Vineyard last fall. Sheriff Javier Salazar opened an investigation in September saying nearly 50 Venezuelan migrants were, quote, exploited and hoodwinked into making the trip for political posturing. Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis claimed credit 
for flying the migrants to Martha's Vineyard, but said the migrants were not misled. The case is now under review at the Bear County District Attorney's Office. Today is D-Day. It marks the 79th anniversary of the invasion of the beaches at Normandy in northern France by troops from the U.S., Canada, the U.K., and other countries during World War II. In 1944, France was occupied by the armies of Nazi Germany. Despite their success, around 4,000 Allied troops were killed by German soldiers defending the beaches. At the time, the D-Day invasion was the largest naval, air, and land operation in history. Former Vice President Mike Pence is officially running for president, and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is expected to jump in the race later today. Both men join a crowded field that includes Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. By the end of this week, there will be 12 Republicans running for president. Some investors may be rethinking where they think interest rates might be going. One of the drivers for stocks has been expectations that interest rates may go down a bit by the end of the year. But with parts of the economy still strong, there are now worries that rates could stay higher than expected and be a drag on stock markets. One of the biggest shipping companies in the country may be less than two months away from a possible strike. 350,000 workers at UPS, represented by the Teamsters, will see their contract run out at the end of July. The union is set to begin voting this week on a strike authorization. Hollywood is facing the prospect of another strike. The Guild representing actors has authorized a strike if they don't have a deal by the end of the month. The Writers Guild has been on the picket lines for more than five weeks. GM is pumping more than a billion dollars into plants that make gas and diesel power heavy duty trucks. The company says it plans to be making internal combustion engines at least through the decade. GM has also set a goal of only building electric passenger vehicles by 2035. Today is your last chance to vote early in the city's runoff election. Polls are open until 8 p.m. today. San Antonio residents must decide who will represent districts 1 and 7 on city council. Election day is Saturday. You can find a list of polling locations on ksat.com. And that is today's 9 at 9. In your morning headlines, we break down the latest technology unveiled at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference, including the latest details on the Vision Pro headset. And a big update to the story we brought you yesterday on that 13-year-old golf prodigy trying to make the U.S. Open. Max Massey joins us live in the studio. And Max, where are we starting this morning? Good morning, guys. We have a lot to talk about. Remember the U.S. Open in the back of your head because we're going to talk about that more after everything else. I want to start with the Virginia plane crash. And really, my biggest concern, why it took 90 minutes to scramble jets to react to what should be, in theory, the most secure airspace in our country, if not the world. So before we really dive into the national security threats, let's look at what actually happened with the plane. Officials say the pilot of the jet was unresponsive for more than an hour before the fighter jets were even sent. Investigators now working deep in the Virginia wilderness, a three hour hike from the nearest road. That's where the Cessna Citation jet crashed on Sunday. The jet took off from Tennessee around 1:15 Sunday afternoon. It was headed to Long Island. Less than 15 minutes after takeoff, the veteran pilot was no longer responding to air traffic controllers. The plane reaching Long Island, then turning around, flying over New York and the Washington, D.C. airspace. It would take 90 minutes before the military launched their F-16s, one of them breaking the sound barrier, even causing a sonic boom. Left off, stopping 7275, this is on-air defense fighter, on guard, 1.5. Why did it take so long to get these other aircraft scrambled and in the air, the F-16s? That's going to be one of the key questions here to be answered. Now, the fighter pilots say they could see the pilot slumped over the NTSB, considering whether a sudden loss of cabin pressure could have incapacitated all of those on board. But with the force of the crash decimating the plane, figuring out what exactly happened may be difficult. Investigators, they're going to be at the crash site for a few more days. Before that wreckage, likely airlifted to another location for further investigation, they haven't found a black box, but in this type of plane, technically, you are not required to even have one. All right, now to something that I and so many, we'll say hobbyist golfers, will never do. Try to qualify for the U.S. Open. Only this competitor, the 13-year-old. So we introduced you to Jaden Song yesterday. We now have a big update. Sadly, Jaden did miss the final qualifying cut for the U.S. Open yesterday, but remember the name because if he's doing this at 13 years old the future 
probably pretty bright. Seventh grader from Burbank, California, skipping school to compete at Hillcrest Country Club, shooting seven over, coming in 58th out of 89 competitors, 16 strokes out of the top five needed to proceed to the tournament at the Los Angeles Country Club beginning June 15th. But if Jaden had qualified, he would have become the youngest golfer ever to play at the U.S. Open, surpassing Andy Zhang, who was just 14 when he played in 2012 in San Francisco. However, after a 12-foot playoff putt to secure a spot on Monday's 36-hole final round, he made history the youngest player ever to advance to the final stage of qualifier for the U.S. Open. All right, we're going to talk about the U.S. Open more in just a bit. But before we get there, I'm sure you guys have seen this, right? It's the, the fancy new goggles from Apple. They're celebrating with the company. is called the biggest product launch in years. They're unveiling the Vision Pro. If you don't know what that is, I didn't either. It is a new virtual and augmented reality headset. It's called the most ambitious product for Apple yet. The company really betting that virtual reality is more than just a tech fad. Apple saying once a user puts on the device, they're able to see apps directly projected in front of them at the event, the unveiling. Apple showed off a range of unique experiences with the product. You have apps for medicine, productivity, and entertainment. Speaking of which, the Disney CEO, Bob Iger, joined the Apple event, like this special guest, discussed how Disney can incorporate and create content for the new Vision Pro headset. Tim Cook, though, optimistic that this could really be a paradigm shift in the technology landscape. You can see hear, and interact with digital content right in your physical space. And this is a huge idea. And so you can use your apps, and they can be any size that you want. You can immerse yourself in movies, TV shows, sports, and feel like you're right there. Apple now jumping into that space that Facebook parent company Meta has tried to conquer. With, remember, it has its Oculus headset in the Metaverse, but the Metaverse really hasn't done much, and sales for the Oculus products have underperformed. With the Vision Pro, Apple offering higher-end components, better build quality, more features, including the ability to record and play back 3D images and video. So, guys, I think uh, this is very cool. I don't want to take anything away from it. Uh, before taxes and everything, it does start at $3,500, oh yes. so there, there is that. Uh, I also want to point out other things that were unveiled at the Developers Day. A lot of cool features in the current constructed Apple products that aren't $3,500. Uh, there's a check-in uh, app kind of thing where if you're out and about, you can check in with your loved ones. I know that's great for parents if, you know, kids are out and about at night, want to make sure they're home safe. I get that. What I thought was really cool, now, with um, not iMessage, but uh, what a, what a FaceTime. Mm -hmm. You can leave FaceTime voicemails. Okay. So that's pretty that makes cool. Sense. Yeah, so there's a lot going on in and about Apple. I want to go back to the U.S. Open because there's breaking news. Look at us doing breaking news right in the middle of a uh, headline. So the PGA Tour agreeing to merge with the Saudi-backed rival Live Golf. And I know this was a huge controversy for months, so much so that there is a lot of pending litigation. But the really, the biggest part of this is the golfers can play in all the tournaments, right. and it ends all of that pending litigation. So after months and months of controversy, yeah. it is all dropped, and everyone, I guess, can play in any tournament they want. Yeah, I mean, so, so a lot of big names defected to Live Golf, mm -hmm. uh, left PGA behind, and now here we are. Kumbaya, everybody's happy. And <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, so it's, it is a shocking golf merger, that's for sure. Absolutely. It'll be interesting to see what comes next because Live, they stream all of their tournaments. Right. And obviously the PGA Tour, we're watching them every Saturday and Sunday. Right, so there's TV rights at stake as well. All right, Max, lots to think about there. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Thank guys. You. All right, breaking sports news. 9-11, 74 degrees coming up on GMSA at 9. A bond between mother and daughter can be very strong, and this family we're going to introduce you to next proves what you can do when you have that support system. When we come back, how this duo helped each other both graduate from college. We are continuing our great graduate series this morning. We've heard some pretty great stories. And today we are introducing you to a mother and daughter duo who not only went to college together, but have gotten three degrees each together. Highly impressive. Ursula Perry shares the story of what inspired them to continue their education and what's next for them. Elisa and Elizabeth Myers are no strangers to doing life together. They are mother and daughter, but more than that, they're best friends who have supported each other throughout all of their degrees. We went through our associates, our bachelors, and our master's. 
master's and we do plan to go for a PhD also together. The two of them graduated with a master's in social work from Our Lady of the Lake University. But that journey was not easy. When Elizabeth was graduating high school, her grandfather, Elisa's dad, passed away suddenly and his death hit hard, especially since Elisa's husband passed away in the same month just a few years before. But I always tell myself, you have to keep going, Elizabeth. You have to keep fighting. You have to remember who's watching you and how proud they are. On top of losing their loved ones, they also lost their house to Hurricane Harvey. And that's when they decided to start a new life. It's time for me to finally go back. I want to say I have a degree. And that is exactly what they did. The duo would get their associates, their bachelors, then their masters. It's been a blessing and an honor to go to school with her. It's been good to be able to have the bond that we have, and I wouldn't trade it for anything else. They both plan to get their PhD, but for now, they're going to focus on their jobs and moving into a brand new house together. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Very impressive. Congratulations. Let's look out there with live cam. 75 degrees, you know, warming up a little bit from this morning. Yeah, clear skies too. If you remember yesterday at this time, we had storms already bubbling up. Not the case today. So we know it's going to be a little bit quieter into the afternoon. Yes. And uh, this is something Mark will be doing soon. He'll be on uh, a plane. Yes. <laughs> but I want to show you this picture. picture. This is so cool. This is from 2,000 feet. You see the storms yesterday uh, from the eye of a, a plane seat there looking out the window. And I love looking at our beautiful city. Uh, it is, is a nice, nice shot here. Uh, Ray sent this in on, on KSAC Connect. But yes, you can see the storms that bubbled up yesterday. Uh, in the distance and some of these storms back to punch. We had some reports of small hail, some good rain in spots. Again, we have the opportunity to see some rain today. It's just not going to be as widespread as it was yesterday. The authority radar not showing us anything at all right now, and I don't expect we'll see anything here over the next couple of hours. But as we look at the forecast, yes, there is going to be some pop up activity. This is two o'clock shows a couple of showers and storms starting to take shape. And it's going to be random like yesterday, hit or miss type stuff around five o'clock. It's just that the coverage will be less. We don't have as much lift. High pressure is kind of starting to nudge in and that takes away some of our better rain chances. This is around eight o'clock. Does show a few isolated storms holding on, but by 10 o'clock, most of that is gone. Here's our case at 12 hour forecast as you plan out your day. We're going to go mostly sunny till about the lunch hour. Then we may start to see some clouds build. 20% uh, chance of a shower storm as we get into the afternoon. Uh, again, uh, chances aren't great. 88 degrees is our forecast high. And then we bring the rain chances down as we get into tonight. And by the way, it'll feel a little bit warmer than 88. Thanks to all the humidity we have in place. Satellite picture, not showing a lot. Again, we've got clear skies over San Antonio right now. We'll look for some of those cumulus clouds to take shape a little bit later today and we'll see if they can develop into something. As we look across Texas, it's a little quieter as a whole here as well. We've got some showers and storms down in the Gulf of Mexico. In the big picture, you know, the, the pattern across the country is pretty interesting in the sense that it's kind of stuck at the moment. We've got an area of low pressure out west, one across the northeast. We're kind of in the middle where it's, uh, it's somewhat unsettled, but not uh, terribly unsettled. And then we've got some smoke with the, this is interesting, coming out of Canada, that is affecting parts of the East Coast. Not only that, interesting, it's very dry up here. They actually have fire concerns this afternoon. You don't see that very often across the Northeast. They have a significant fire threat today. So just kind of an odd pattern as a whole here across the country. Now it does change a little bit as we go forward. High pressure starts to nudge in uh, here across Texas. And that's why our rain chances really aren't that great. We can't completely take them out next couple days and over the weekend, but they really do come down. And by next week, high pressure really starts to grow and strengthen. And we know what this means. It takes our rain chances out and it cranks our temperatures up. So by the middle part of next week, could we be pushing 100? Yes, we don't really want to talk about it, but it's a possibility. Uh, here are the temperatures, high temperatures as we look forward through at least Monday. And we're going all the way up to 96 by Monday. The average is 92, so this is above average. And speaking of the triple digits, our average first 100 degree day is June 26th. So we're getting in that range. Earliest is February 21st. That was back in 1996. That was uh, kind of an interesting, weird year. Uh, the latest is September 6th, set just a few years ago, 2021. And we've had several years where we've been hit 100 degrees at all 
uh, 2007 being the last. We'll see how this year plays out, but it is looking like next year is going to be, or next year, next week is going to be pretty toasty. Uh, next year's good. Next year's right, well, yeah, let's just push it to next year. Uh, 90 Wednesday, 92 Thursday. So, still some small rain chances there. Again, nothing that uh, jumps off the page. Though. Seriously, so February in 1996, we had 100 degrees. We did, yeah. I don't uh, remember that. It was just one day. Did we was, passed through the tail of a comet or something? <laughs> I mean, it was weird because we got up to uh, near 100, and then by the end of the month, a huge cold front came through, and it was really cold. Oh, wow. So, uh, I, I believe it. I that's, mean, that's how it goes around here. Uh, it Texas does. weather. Yeah. All right. It keeps Thank it interesting. You. It does. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. 921, 76 degrees. A fresh fit has been leading to a fresh start for local teens. When we come back, Tiffany Huertas explains how local nonprofit is changing lives of hundreds of kids in our community and how you can get involved. 925, just this year, a local nonprofit has helped over 4,000 at risk kids by providing free new clothes and accessories, and they hope to reach more kids with the community's help. Tiffany Huertas takes us to San Antonio Threads, located near Broadway and Centennial Drive, just east of the airport, with how you can give back. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning, Mark and Stephanie. And now we're talking about over 70,000 teens have been helped since they opened in 2016. Incredible. I want to take you inside one of the rooms here. Just check it out. All of this is brand new items, and it's all donated. Right here, it tells you, Teens can come here and they can choose two tops, two bottoms, accessories, and so much more. But all of this is not possible without donations. If we go to this room right here, we have someone very special, Kathy Hamilton. She's the CEO and founder of the nonprofit. Good morning, Kathy. Tell us about um, how, how this year has been so far for you. So this year has been another really busy year. Um, we have already served more than 4,000 youth in San Antonio alone. So we are on track to serve probably 20,000 kids in San Antonio. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Incredible numbers, yes. <laughs> what type of impact have you seen in our community? So what we have seen over the seven years that we've been open is that our kids are able to stay in school. Um, we definitely know with uh, providing new clothing, it always fits. It combats bullying. It keeps our kids in dress code. Um, and for our older youth, it keeps them employable. It helps them get jobs. So it definitely makes an impact with our families that just cannot afford to provide for their youth. It definitely alleviates that stress um, for those families that just simply cannot provide. This year, you all are celebrating a yes. big birthday. Tell me, how can the community also celebrate with you? Sure, we would love for people to come out. We are having our seventh birthday brunch at Rock and Bruce, uh, July 14th. The event is on Eventbrite. Tickets are $25. That means you get a delicious brunch. You get to hang out with us. There will be photo ops. There are raffle prizes. We're going to have plenty of donation boxes out. So we hope that everybody brings a pair of new shoes, a package of underwear, a hoodie, a pair of jeans, a pair of khakis, and help us stock this shop. Because more than likely, back to school is our busiest time of year, and we will serve at least 3,000 kids for back to school. So we'd love for everyone to come out and reminisce with us. We love serving our kids and our community, but we definitely need everyone's help. And talking about reminiscing, um, what does this mean for you to be celebrating such a big event? Well, it truly means everything. Every day that we see our kids come in and shop, um, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to know that you have now encouraged, provided what's comfort, confidence, and something that no one else is doing. And um, it means everything to our youth that we serve and that um, these youth are one day going to be you or I, a news reporter, somebody, an entrepreneur, and uh, they know that the community is behind them. And it, it just means everything. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank coming up on the yes, coming up on the noon show. We're going to tell you a little bit more about how this nonprofit started, how you can volunteer in different ways you can participate coming up. We'll send it back to you. We look forward to it. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Tiffany. Right now, 928, 76 degrees. We'll be right back. Let's look out there with live cam. In the 70s now, we started at 67. Uh, it was a pretty nice morning, but I know what's coming later in the week, Justin. Yeah, it only gets worse next week, too. <laughs> it's not great news. A lot of heat set it our way. I'll, I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, the heat index today probably gets, gets up to around 90 or so. We're already starting to see temperatures jump into the 80s. So it's going to be a warm day today, but next week 
uh, gets even worse. I want to show you a pollen count. If you missed this, molds are in the moderate category. They are down big time, though, from yesterday. If you remember yesterday, we had 11,000 something. Uh, today, they're down to 840 in moderates. So that's good. But they've been bouncing back and forth. Grass is low at 30. Uh, here's rain chances over the next few days. We've had some good showers, some good downpours. Last several days, those rain chances really start to fall off. Today about a 20% chance, tomorrow only a 10% chance, maybe another 20% chance Thursday. But the bottom line here is we're seeing a bit of a pattern shift to more of a drier and hotter type pattern. And as we look at the satellite right now, not a lot of cloud cover out there. We do notice some clouds out near Del Rio, Eagle Pass, and New Valley, but clear skies here in San Antonio. We'll see some clouds build in a little bit later this afternoon. Temperatures at this hour sitting in 75 in San Antonio, but already up to 80 in Catula. 74 Gonzalez and 71 right now in Kerrville in mid 70s here around town. Uh, we'll talk about the heat. As I mentioned, we're also going to talk about Puerto Rico because interestingly enough, they've had some big time heat down there. We'll tell you why and look at the forecast into the weekend too. coming up in just a couple of minutes, guys. Justin, thank you. A quick update, folks. If you haven't been paying attention this morning, we've still got that incident out there on the far northwest side at 10 and 1604 UTSA Boulevard area right now. We had an accident earlier and we've now got some construction in the area as well. So lots of problems out there. Look for significant delays, especially on Loop 1604, both east and westbound, right around the I-10 area. I-10 itself looks pretty good right now. Well, tensions are heating up over migrants being sent away from border cities. This after a second plane with migrants was flown to California earlier this week. Our Sarah Costa joins us live here in the studio, and we understand we have new information this morning from the Department of Homeland Security regarding the number of recent deportations. Yeah, that's right. Good morning, Mark. The Department of Homeland Security has released its latest numbers of detentions and deportations from the border. DHS says that since the lifting of Title 42, unlawful entries along the southwest border have decreased by more than 70 percent since May 11th. Homeland Security credits this decrease as a result of stiffer consequences for unlawful entry with the historic expansion of lawful pathways and processes. From May 12th to June 2nd of this year, DHS deported over 38,000 non-citizens under Title VIII authorities, including single adults and families to more than 80 countries. Now, according to DHS, that number includes over 1,400 non-citizens from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela who were also returned to Mexico under Title VIII authorities. Now, today, the Texas Senate reconvenes in a special session and border security will be a big topic of discussion. The agenda will focus on increasing or enhancing penalties for crimes involving smuggling people or operating a stash house. Republican Texas State Senator Pete Flores from Pleasanton is the author of Senate Bill 5 that focuses on penalties for human smuggling cases. He said in a press release, quote, Increasing the penalties of these heinous crimes is crucial to deter criminals from these actions, end quote. Democratic Texas State Senator Jose Menendez spoke with KSAT last week about border security and hopes the state Senate can take a different approach. Look, we can all agree that, there, that we have to have a strong and secure border. Uh, I, obviously, we want to do everything we can to stop the trafficking of people, of drugs, of crime, criminal activity. But we also, I think we need to have a humane approach. And businesses also are looking for people that they can afford to pay to do jobs that others don't want to do. That special Senate, all, that special session already underway. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick announced that he will hold a press conference date at 1.30 with updates on the special session. So tune in on air and online for what comes out of that press conference right here on KSAT. Mark and Stephanie. Thank you, Sarah. In other news, it appears the U.S. labor market is doing well despite fears of recession that lingered for months. In fact, payrolls in the public private sector increased by 339,000 last month. But what about in San Antonio? Well, Max Massey spoke with local employers, job seekers and workforce solutions Alamo to get a local evaluation. I'm just looking for a job and they're helping me out, you know, with finding employment and they're helping me out, you know, with what resources that they have. Meet Tracy Lopez. Like more than 40,000 people in our community, she's looking for a job. The latest job numbers show that more than 43,000 locals are seeking meaningful employment. That might seem like a lot, but consider we have a total labor force of more than 1.2 million. Overall, our local labor market is strong. In fact, 
The CEO of Workforce Solutions Alamo tells me we are the strongest we've been in years. Today we set about 3.4% unemployment, uh, which is actually lower than the state's 3.7% unemployment. So we're doing really, really well um, over the course of from like April of 2022 to April of 2023 at about 44,000 jobs. And it's not just the unemployment numbers that look good. There's also improved job creation. We're uh, below uh, pre-pandemic levels, right? It's great, great indicator, great job growth, 44,000 new jobs, great uh, increase in labor force, 43,000 people new into the labor force. And Adrian Lopez tells me regardless of the different 11 sectors that they track, they've seen positive job growth across the board. The thing is, there are local employers who are still looking to fill a good amount of positions. Ana Maria Garza Cortez with Centro Med says they're actively looking for employees. We have been struggling with the labor market ever since the pandemic. So we're finding more families or individuals that are applying for jobs but are having a hard time wanting to work in the clinics. And she added that a big obstacle is people wanting to only work virtually from home. So really that leaves the door open for others who are looking for jobs across San Antonio. Our medical assistant positions are starting at $17.50 an hour, which is a good salary for a medical assistant to start off in. And Max Joy just here live in the studio to talk more about this story. Max, what was your, your biggest takeaway? You know, the biggest takeaway for me was people refusing to take jobs that aren't virtual. I, I understand a lot of people did so because of their current conditions, but just hearing employers really discuss, we have all these open positions, and one of the first questions that they ask people is, you're okay with coming in and coming to work? And immediately people will throw out the application and say, no, that's not for me. Even at higher paying jobs with all of this availability and jobs that you would otherwise think, I mean, that was Centro Med, you go into the clinics, yeah. you work with people and still people <laughs> were like, no, 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 we're just virtual. And it was kind of a jarring situation that even after the pandemic, that paradigm shift has stayed with us. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, so we, we came we came to work, you of know, I mean, like physically. So for us, it's like not a big deal. But I think for the people who really got into their routines or maybe their commute was a little further away, right. um, maybe that's why. But you know, speaking of, you yeah. know, tell us, did you all talk about the I-35 corridor? Yes, I feel like you can't talk to businesses or real estate people or property managers in today's age without really talking about this huge expansion of that I-35 corridor and the job creation. Uh, you know, Adrian Lopez specifically talked about the Tesla factory and a lot of people who live in Bear County and actually commute to Travis County. And I can only assume because living in Travis County is overly expensive. <laughs> it's not a shot at Austin, but you know, the truth <laughs> is the truth. So they live here in Bear County and the job creation along that I-35 corridor between here and Austin, it's been so expansive that there's so many job opportunities, high paying jobs. You can live cheaper in Bear County, love Bear County, uh, and work there. And instead of spending so much money that you earn in your job in Austin, you live more like a king here. So you, men you mentioned headwinds in the macro economy. Mm -hmm. Was there any projection there about what could happen next? Oh, so there was uh, a lot of ambiguities here. Okay. Uh, so Adrian was like, look, we have a lot of economists. We talk to them on a day-to-day -day basis. It's basically impossible to project forward. But, you know, as we talk about on this show all the time, interest rates, mortgage rates, it's going to be interesting to see what happens next. All he said right now is our local economy, very strong our labor market stronger than the national and stronger than the state economy. So everything looks good from a Bear County perspective. I have a personal question for you. Uh, you get excited about business <laughs> yes. and economics. You talk about it like some guys talk about sports. Have you always been like this? Uh, you know, it's always been interesting because yeah. it really does. And one thing that people don't understand is when we talk about these large scale you know, situations, the trickle down effect that impacts homeowners, it impacts families, it impacts Always. everyone. What we buy at the grocery store, our yeah. daily paychecks, yeah. what we pay on our mortgages. And so sure. to, to kind of talk at a thousand foot view and then be able to break it down on a local level, I feel like it's really important for you know, our local viewers and our local yeah. families. I love that. Yeah. Love that. I was also, just curious. Yeah. yeah. He also talks big about sports as well. I do. I yeah, do that also. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That goes without saying. All right. Yeah. Philly fan. Thank you, Max Massey. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Right now it is 941, 76 degrees. You're watching GMSA at night. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's 945.
And as promised, I've been mentioning Puerto Rico. We're like, oh, why are we talking about Puerto Rico? Why aren't we talking about Puerto Rico? Well, because <laughs> it's important. Uh, because uh, heat, index, heat index here today is going to be around 90. But down there in Puerto Rico, the heat index is going to be close to 120 in some <gasps> cases. Yesterday, the heat index was around 125 down there in Puerto Rico. And here's why. We've got a ridge of high pressure. This is strong. They've got some Saharan dust moving over. A lot of factors coming together. But the numbers are huge. So, yes, it's always hot in Puerto Rico. Okay, it's very tropical there. They always have a lot of humidity. But these numbers start to move into the dangerous territory. When you're talking 116, this is the forecast heat index for today, by the way. This is where you start to get into some trouble. The island of Calabria yesterday had some heat indices close to 120. So this is not very fun, even for Puerto Rico. And they've had some power outages there, too. So you can imagine that's not a great situation. Anyway, that's we wanted to point that out. The, the pattern across the country is pretty interesting uh, just in general. But uh, those folks down there in the Caribbean also dealing with some unusual weather. Uh, 75 right now. Dew point is at 65. We've got clear skies here in San Antonio and temperatures are starting to ramp up. Satellite picture shows no cloud cover. If you remember yesterday at this time, we had clouds starting to bubble up. Some storms already starting to develop. Not the case today. And I think coverage of rainfall will be lower today. We do notice some clouds out there in Del Rio and Eagle Pass. Temperatures out there 78 in Del Rio. Warm spot as it often is. Catula sitting at 80. 74 New Braunfels, 73 Kerrville. Mid 70s for much of San Antonio at this hour. Uh, the heat index, there's not much of a heat index there, but I think as we get into the afternoon, you will see that heat index start to climb. And we showed you we could potentially have a feels like number up close to 90 when it's all said and done. Uh, big picture across Texas, we've got some showers and storms out in the Gulf, but not much across the state right now. There still is a, a little disturbance off to our east, but it's moving away and actually high pressure is starting to nudge in. And that's why our rain chances are going down. Let me show you the forecast here. This is one of our computer models. Did a pretty good job yesterday kind of laying out the idea that we'd see some of these pop up showers and storms. And I think that'll be the case again today. So four or five o'clock, one or two of these storms popping up. If you're lucky enough to be underneath one, you could get some heavy rain. Yesterday, there was some small hail involved. Can't completely rule that out, but we're now looking for large scale severe weather or anything like that uh, eight o'clock most of this is starting to die down and by 10 o'clock uh, it'll all go away i mentioned that ridge pipe pressure actually starts to build in a little bit so this is thursday at five o'clock and then by the weekend still there still kind of nudging in but it's next week where it really starts to push north and we start to really feel the effects now by the weekend we'll have temperatures in the mid 90s it'll be hot but next week could be even hotter, I'm sorry to say. And there are some indications that we could be pushing triple digits at some point next week. We don't want to go there just yet, but uh, just keep that in mind. Next week's going to be toasty. And maybe you're heading to the beach this weekend. It'd be a good weekend for it. We'll see sunny skies Friday, Saturday, Sunday down there. Uh, not a lot of uh, height. The, the, uh, the sea's there two feet, two to three feet Saturday, Sunday. Uh, and the water temperature is 82 to 86, so that's uh, that's pretty nice. It is a good beach weekend. Just pack the sunscreen, lots of it. Uh, 90 Wednesday, 92 Thursday, some small chances of rain there. It's going to be some of that pop-up stuff. Maybe Friday night and Saturday morning, we could see a few showers and storms as well. And then past that, I think it's pretty much just hot, and we take rain chances out. Hmm. We're getting so used to those rain chances and keeping those temperatures in check. It's been so nice. We don't want to repeat of last summer. We are moving into more of an El Nino type pattern. So hopefully we'll get some back and forth this summer and still get some rain on top of the heat that we know is going to occur. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yes. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. 949, 77 degrees. And if you like hot Cheetos, you might be interested in this latest biopic. When we come back, we're going to get a preview of the new film about the popular snack food, which will be available to stream on Friday. And as we head to break, here's a look at some of the activities going on at public libraries around San Antonio. Today, tween time will be happening at the Central Library from 2 to 3. Kids ages 9 to 12 can hang out, play games, and watch movies. Also happening this afternoon, a fun sensory experience at the San Pedro Library. Kids ages 5 to 12 can visit different sensory stations and enrich their mindfulness, awareness, and playfulness. That'll be going on from 4 to 6 p.m. Or look at all the events scheduled today for different public libraries around the Alamo City. Just head to the KSAT Kids section of KSAT.com. 
Biopics about popular products are having their moment right now, and the latest one takes actress Eva Longoria behind the camera. Her latest project tells a story about a popular snack food and Latino culture. CNN's Rick Damagella gives us a preview of the new film. Ow, 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 ow. What is it? It burns. So stop eating it. No, I like it. It was good. Flame and Hot is based in part on the book A Boy, a Burrito, and a Cookie from Janitor to Executive by former Frito Lay marketer Richard Montañez. I know I don't look it, but I got a PhD. Hmm. I'm poor, hungry, and determined, sir. The film was directed by Eva Longoria, and while the Flame and Hot Cheetos flavor is at the center of the story, Latino culture and family are at its heart. I honestly knew when I came on to direct this that my superpower was knowing my community. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, oh, Oh, this movie I know. Like, I got it. <laughs> right. um, and so every detail in the movie, from the tapatio on the table to the music playing in the kitchen to uh, the costume design, it was a joy to finally show the world that our community is beautiful and full of people that are, are, are faith-based and um, hardworking and family-oriented. You know, we're not just the negative stereotypes you see in the news. I've never met someone who is that specific and that skilled. Guild. She made it a point to have if as, as many department heads as she could um, be Latino to authenticate the story. You know, she has a master's in Chicano studies. Like, she knew what had to go into it. She knew that it's important for us to tell our stories so that they transcend and break cultural barriers. Ow, 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 burn. Burn burn good or burns bad? bad? It burns good. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. I thought we were the only ones that said that. Okay. And speaking of movies, if you're interested in taking the kids to the movies, some theaters in San Antonio are showing free or discounted films this summer. So Alamo Draft House, AMC, Evo, Regal, and Santicos are among those offering deals to people of all ages, including some for children as young as three years old. You can read all about the offerings right now on our website at kset.com. Just look for this web story. Problems persist out there on the northwest side due to an accident earlier this morning. Almost all the lanes have reopened. We still have a ramp uh, problem out at 10 and 1604. Uh, that and the construction that is an everyday occurrence are causing big delays on Loop 1604 in both directions right there south of the Rim Shopping Center. Now, as you can see there in that transguide shot, uh, the sun is out, so we know it's going to be a hot day. Mostly sunny to start, some partly cloudy skies this afternoon, only a 20% chance of rain today, so it's not going to be the kind of coverage we were looking at yesterday. Small chance tomorrow, another small chance Thursday, maybe Friday night into Saturday. But the big story, I think the main takeaway here is going to be the heat as we head into the weekend. Heat indices is near 100 by Saturday, Sunday into Monday. At least you won't be here for the triple digits until you There's come back. That. But I come back to it in a couple weeks, that's Aww. for sure. Going to miss you guys. We're going to miss you too. Have, have fun. Yes, Thank have you. a great yes. trip. See you in a couple weeks. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, Mark. <laughs>